con is a concrete or a, an outpicturing of judgment. And the only way that, that you solve that is by stop judging. <laughs> stop ordering the thoughts. Why do we keep coming back to these things called preferences? You know, what is the big deal about all these preferences? Well, preferences are judgments. And preferences, since they are judgments, are holding the world in place. Are, are continuing to maintain the hallucination. If I continue to have preferences, and I'm going to, I continue to judge, and I continue to see a, a world of, of, of judgment, of duality, of pain, of conflict, of suffering, of sickness, of death, oh, it's not worth it. I don't want to have any more preferences. <laughs> I'd rather have the kingdom of heaven than have preferences. And you put it in that kind of a context, what's the, you know, what's the big deal about preferences <laughs> when you can have the kingdom of heaven? in your awareness. This is not vision. It is merely an illusion of reality because my judgments have, met, have been made quite apart from reality. I am willing to recognize the lack of validity in my judgments because I want to see. My judgments have hurt me and I do not want to see according to them. To the deceived mind, judgments have value. Judgments seem to bring order into chaos. And all you really need to do is you keep looking and start to see judgments do not bring me anything I want. They have absolutely no value. They never have had value. And if I let go of all my judgments, I won't have total chaos. I will have peace and joy in the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's what we keep looking at as we keep going deeper and deeper, is just really seeing that the judgments have no value. If I can really see that, why would I continue to do that? In the section on, in the teacher's manual, when Jesus speaks of, of judgment, he says it's not that you shouldn't judge, it just says that you're totally incapable of judging. You're trying to do something that you can't, you don't have a capability for it. Number three, I do not understand anything I see. How could I understand what I see when I have judged it amiss? What I see is the projection of my own errors of thought. I do not understand what I see because it is not understandable. There is no sense in trying to understand it. But there is every reason to let it go and make room for what can be seen and understood and loved. I can exchange what I see now for this merely by being willing to do so. Is not this a better choice than the one I made before? can see how sentences four and five, I do not understand what I see because it is not understandable. There is no sense in trying to understand it. A lot of times we joke a lot about wonder questions. You know, wonder why this happened or wonder why that happened or this or that. You can see how those two sentences dispel, if you really believe, if you really put your faith in those sentences four and five, that would bring an end to the wonder questions. What's the point? If the world isn't, under, isn't understandable and it can't ever be understood, then why, why try to? Why try to understand it? That, that's madness or that's insanity to try to understand what can't be understood. And again, this is just something to, to take a look at because as you observe your mind, as you go through daily life, you will see these questions pop to mind. And as you really begin to see it and you really begin to question it, 
you will move into mysticism. You will not try to continue to play the game of the world and be a teacher of God. That will hurt. It's very difficult. It takes, a, it takes an enormous strain to try to play the game of the world and to be a teacher of God. And you'll be grateful to not play the game anymore. Why you use the power of your mind invested in something that there is no payoff, there's only cost involved. Themes during the along as you go along the journey, you come across this thing called complete non-compromise, and and it seems too much to ask through for the ego, and it seems too overwhelming, and it seems too unreachable and too impossible. But I'll guarantee you, as soon as you embrace non-compromise completely, totally, as soon as you come to the edge of the cliff and you jump. It will be the, the greatest decision or the greatest thing that you've ever done. That's where all the ease comes in from embracing the non-compromise. Non-compromise again about what? Well, let's go back to, less, to sentences four and five. I do not understand what I see because it is not understandable. There is no sense in trying to understand it. I still have a hard time with that, with just the everyday things that we do, or seem to do anyway. You know, how, how do I get in my car and proceed to drive if I, what I see doesn't mean anything? Well, and I, we, because we talked one time about, you know, not asking every single step of the way because that would be too much or something, so do I say, you know, Holy Spirit, do I stop at this light, do I turn right, or do I turn left, when I know that I'm trying to get the mountain jacks, do I say, do I want to turn right or left here? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, and this is the question that came, comes up at the very end of the journal that we're putting out, this is one of the last things that's brought up, and, you know, this, what these lessons are pointing to is that, that if you let go of all ordering the thoughts, of all judgments, everything, your mind, you will awaken. In coming to that, it seems as if, if you describe the met it as a metaphor of process, like awakening is a process. In that metaphor, because it's not a process, it's just an instant, but if you talk about it as a process, then, it, then you could say in that metaphor that the Holy Spirit is judgmental in the sense that the, the guidance that the mind receives, which is form guidance, it could be call so-and-so, turn left at this light, go to Taco Bell, <laughs> whatever, you know, such and such and such. That seems pretty specific. That seems to involve some ordering. How could you, t how could you discern whether to go left or right at the light? How could you discern between Taco Bell and Pizza Hut? You know, That's how could point. you... You know, how could you make any judgment, and how would you seem to do anything functionally in this world without judgment? And what the Course is saying is, again, as part of the metaphor, as if it's a process, that the Holy Spirit is judgmental in the deceived mind. In other words, the deceived mind thinks it's in a maze, and the Holy Spirit is metaphorically guiding the mind out of the maze. Turn left, turn right, go left, left left again, right there, you know, it's as if, as if in a maze there's, there's little junctures. If you know what a maze is, you know that you got to make, there's a decision points, a lot of decision points. That seems to be judgmental. Well, how can the Holy Spirit know left versus right? But again, that's implying that, that it's a process and it's still as if the mind is a person in the world. So here's the beliefs and here's the world that the beliefs are producing. And back here would be where the Holy Spirit would be. 
And the Holy Spirit is not talking to the person in the world. The Holy Spirit is working with the deceived mind to let go and give up these beliefs that are producing the world. So, as long as the mind still has beliefs, though, in the ego, it can't help but interpret itself as a person in the world. Therefore, when it says, Holy Spirit, help me, what should I do now? And it seems as if the person hears the words in their mind, will say, for example, call so-and-so, go to such and such a church, go to Taco Bell, go to Pizza Hut, whatever. Wait, that, you're confusing me now. You just said Taco Bell and Pizza Hut. Either one, either or. Or both. Or both. Excellent. First go to Taco Bell, then go to Pizza Hut, whatever. Which seems to be judgmental, that's what your original question is. Once again, that's the interpretation that, that the mind is making. As if it's hearing a voice, and as if that voice is telling it to go, we'll say, to Taco Bell. That's the interpretation. What these lessons are talking about is it's saying, question all of this right here, and this will disappear as well. You won't see a world. Seemingly, in the process, as you seem to be doing that, there will seem to be interpretations of what to do, what not to do, read the Course, do this, do that. Those are, are just interpretations that the mind has. It's as if the Holy Spirit infuses through the beliefs and is talking to a person. That's not the case, but that's the way it seems. It's really as if persons hear the Holy Spirit is how it seems. So a, a quick summary of that would be, as long as you believe you're in the world, the helpful metaphor would be that the Holy Spirit is judgmental, that in every circumstance you seem to find yourself in, that small still voice in your mind is available and can tell you. And as, the, as it says in the Rules for Decisions, you need not become preoccupied with every step you take. That you start to get a sense of these principles as guiding principles in your life, and that's where the flow comes in. It's also where, at one point in the text, Jesus says, it is possible to bring your mind under my control without conscious effort. In other words, what a state to be tuned in with Jesus or the Holy Spirit without conscious effort. But he goes on to say in that statement, but your mind isn't it, it, your mind isn't trained. You're, you're not capable of that at this point when he was bringing it up at the beginning of the text. In other words, only a highly, highly, highly trained mind can can flow along, you know, and just that's a right mind. Someone who is right minded, it's a flow. It's not a conscious asking, Holy Spirit, what do I do here? Holy Spirit, what do I do here? Holy Spirit, what do I do here? You know, it's more of a flow. It's kind of like when I am with a gathering or doing a session or giving a talk, I don't plan them out, and I don't certainly don't, as I'm going along, have an internal dialogue going on. Oh my gosh, Holy Spirit, what do I do here? What do I say next? What word do I use? <laughs> you, know, you can see how crazy that would be to ask specifically what each word that I should use, you know, that's not it. It's just tuning in to that, aligning with the Holy Spirit, tuning in with that flow, and then it's just a real natural flow. It's like channeling. <laughs> but, you, but it doesn't have to just be speaking. You can have your, your emotions channeled as well. <laughs> Number four. These thoughts do not mean anything. So here we, we're bringing in the elements here of the thinking. The thoughts of which I am aware do not mean anything because I am trying to think without God. What I call, quote, my thoughts are not my real thoughts. My real thoughts are the thoughts I think with God. I am not aware of them because I have made my thoughts to take their place. I am willing to recognize that my thoughts do not mean anything, 
and to let them go. I choose to have them be replaced by what they were intended to replace.